Well, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's really an honor for me to stand here in front of you, and uh, it's my first time here in Berlin, so thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really pleased and really appreciate the invitation, namely in name of the President of the Congress and the Scientific Committee and all of you. Um, let me start with uh, admit that I am a GI. I love to do endoscopy. I love to treat patients. In my speech today, it looks a little bit like I am hired by Greenpeace. Uh, we are talking about green and uh, climate changes and everything. It's a little bit besides of a medical field now. But I think it's not really less unimportant. It's really very important. Not for us, probably not for us, but for our children and our grandchildren. So we have to speak about that. And so therefore, I'm really thankful that I can speak on that. I'm talking on Green Hospital in 2022. What is the driving force for it? Um, green health in the midst of COVID-19 pandemia. Uh, but however, I would really like to recommend and uh, remind you that we are facing another really ongoing and really serious threat worldwide. These are the climate changes and the major consequences for global health. And we spoke on that this, this morning, a couple of minutes ago, about the sandstorm coming down from Kuwait and from the, from the desert. And I've heard you all have these floodings in the desert. It's the same in Europe. So, and we have ongoing discussions about the climate changes, the global warming, the greenhouse effect. And uh, we really should keep in mind that this is um, really now in our main focus. It's all green, the climate change. Uh, you know, we have the Kyoto Agreement, the Paris Agreement, over 140 states set that agreement. Um, and the target, the, the, the goal is to have a net zero emission worldwide. That means climate neutrality. So all of the carbon CO2 you put in, into the uh, surrounding, you put out. And uh, the second goal is, the second uh, reach, reaching goal is um, to decrease global warming by less than two centigrade because that has major consequences and major influences. So we have green all over. We have green airplane, green biogasoline, green steel, green IT, everything is green now. So I would uh, recommend a little bit um, what's meaning for, the, for our for healthcare systems. So what is the driving uh, force for the health system? You see on the left-hand side data from, uh, from the NHS in England, 18 million tons of CO2 of carbon um, spilling out each year, which is 25% of the total public sector emissions in the, in the UK. Uh, in South America, Brazil, 10% of uh, total energy, uh, which is, uh, which is um, get into the system, is uh, by the healthcare system. In the US, the largest consumer of cuts in organic chemicals uh, in the healthcare system. China, 10 billion per year expenditure for healthcare construction. So you see it, it's a worldwide problem. So the global warming, the climate changes, we have to keep that in mind. It's all about CO2 emissions and footprints and the greenhouse effect. And what we saw in the last two years when we have all this lockdown, that we had the lockdown here, as in worldwide, uh, you have home offices, uh, all airlines were grounded, we have a decrease of five point, five point, or almost 6% uh, of the uh, greenhouse effects. So we can see we can do it better. And how can we do it? Because we have to reduce the, uh, the waste. And you see the pictures here, and you see the numbers. In the US, almost one trillion of US dollars annually for, um, for the waste management. What kind of um, waste do we produce every day? 0.5, almost one kilogram of biohazardous waste per hospital bed per day. So that's uh, six million tons of medical waste every year in the US. So, and as I'm a GI doctor, and we are now in the GI uh, section and the GI session now, uh, what's in GI endoscopy? You see it here. Uh, together with the OR, with our friends of surgery, we are the second largest medical waste producers in clinics. That means, uh, per day, per bed, 3.1 kilogram per bed per day. Why is it so? Because uh, we have a high throughput caseload, we have many hospital visits, we have um, multiple non-renewable waste streams, uh, you know all of this decontamination processes of endoscopes, so that will lead really us to the second uh, largest medical waste producers. And then in 2020, the NHS, they 
they proclaimed, they uh, had set two major goals. They called it NHS net zero. They want to be climate neutral or climate neutrality, carbon net zero by the year of 2040 and 2045. And they differentiate between um, emissions they control directly, they call it NHS carbon footprint, or for the emissions they can only influence. They call it NHS carbon footprint plus. What does it mean? Um, you're on the left hand side, you see it here. Um, these are the uh, carbon footprint. You can they are directly uh, control it. That means what kind of fossil fuels do you use for uh, your facility, anesthetics, um, all kind of accessories, um, supply chain and everything. And then you can differentiate to indirect influences, meaning all kind of traveling, food catering of the hospital, business services, the construction of the buildings, um, the staff commuting to, to going to work. These are the indirect um, scopes here. And by that, NHS became the first, the world's first health organization to commit to reach a carbon net zero in the next 25 years. But others follow, and they follow today. Uh, more and more hospitals have set that goal to be greener, to be more um, reflective using um, fossil resources, using resources overall. So many hospital and health systems around the world are reducing their, uh, their CO2 footprint. So we should go more to toward a green and has a healthy hospital. What does it mean? And that defined as a follow. What is a green hospital? A hospital that promotes public health by continuous reducing the CO2 footprint, by eliminating contributing the burden of disease. It's a connection between human health environment and less, not, not less important, but uh, really important, uh, really set goals and strategies to reach that. And that is connected to local needs um, with environmental actions and primary prevention. And of course, really proclaim environmental health and health equity. They also defined the top 10 goals to do that. First, and the first really important thing is leadership. That's all of us. We should be the leader to do that. Uh, so we should prioritize environmental health and implement that in our daily practice, in our daily work. It's all about chemicals in hospitals. So we should really change to safer alternatives than harmful chemicals. It's waste and waste streams, meaning to reduce waste and safely dispose healthcare waste. I will go on that in detail later on. What kind of energy do we need? Do we have green energy we use? Water, reduce hospital water consumption and uh, supply with portable water, transportation about water. <coughs> We talked about that, the patients and staff. What kind of food do you use in hospitals? Pharmaceuticals and drugs, very important. Um, the buildings, facility managing, and of course, purchasing, meaning buy safer and more sustainable products and materials. So what, what can we also do for do with sustainable healthcare? How can we reach that goal? First and really also important is the patient empowerment and self-care. Second, prevention lean service delivery, and low carbon alternatives. What does it mean? Patient empowerment. We should go more in the direction of having a shared decision making between us and our patients. Meaning, I see patients coming to me every day with dyspepsia, with uh, uh, some, and, and they, they, they underwent dozens of upper GIs, endoscopies. And then you send the patient for the next upper GI. These are wasteful procedures. So, and people and patients with end-stage diseases makes it sense to uh, get a 100-year-old uh, patient screened for colorectal cancer? No, it makes no sense. So we have to talk about wasteful procedures. Lean service delivery, what does it mean? Providing medical service closer to your patients. Expanding your virtual healthcare, meaning um, virtual medicine. And uh, minimize your low volume activity. Avoid unnecessary procedures. Prevention, uh, promoting meaning uh, all kind of primary prevention. Reducing the need for secondary health care. And uh, low carbon alternatives, of course, uh, we have to talk about um, bioplastic, um, really less carbon alternatives. 
Wasteful procedures is a really one of my major goals because we know that 25% of procedures are wasteful. Yeah? Uh, why, why does it happen? Because we have economy-driven uh, um, um, topics, we have education-related um, factors, administrative, behavioral problems, technical. And uh, I try to put it in a take-home message. We should really um, pick up a choose-wisely strategy. Choose, choose wisely means not on the medical part, of course, yes, to have a good indication to, for doing procedures, but also on the economic and ecological um, approach. Second, and even um, more um, important, the circular economy. What does circular economy mean? Circular economy means we have a continuous reuse of definite and finite resources while limiting uh, the inputs and outputs. Nowadays, GI and endoscopy in the OR, I take something, I do something, make it, and I throw it away. That's not cycling. You mean, I should really do with the resources you put into the system, you are able to recycle it. And nowadays it's strictly forbidden. Concerning endoscopy, we are now in the GI session here. We are speaking about design of endoscopes, uh, and you all know that the design of an endoscope, the technology is quite the same as 80 years ago. You have the handheld, you have the knobs and the wheels. It's quite not really big difference. The collection and the recycling. Nowadays, we know that 80% of all accessories or scopes uh, could be recyclable. But in the uh, European Union, in the US, it's strictly forbidden by legal authorities because they say, okay, it's probably biohazardous waste that must be burned as sterilized. So we are not allowed to sterilize endoscopes or recycle endoscopes. So what kind of barriers against green and green health and green hospitals do we have and do we keep in mind? And I told about that. Economy-driven, uh, we have a free market healthcare uh, that can really build up and incentivize more procedures. The more procedures, the more money. Second, education-related. Incorrect indications, wasteful procedures, inappropriate surveillance. Third, administrative, you know that, incorrect bookings of procedures, surveillance intervals, et cetera, et cetera. Behavior, defensive medicine, yeah, patients uh, showing up in your practice uh, with belly pain, you send him to the next CT scan. Yeah. And you know that the last CT scan was one year ago. Makes no sense. But you do that because you are not really, you, are, you, have, you, have, you have the fear against uh, to be suited by the patient. Financial, they have the lack of uh, funding to, to move on with these changes. What else in endoscopy? And uh, you all know that um, we are facing problems also there. We have cross-contamination and outbreaks uh, via the ERCP endoscopes. This is a colleague here in the US standing in front of the media press um, explaining why, why he had really big, big problems. Septic um, complications with multi-drug um, organisms spreading from patient to patient via the endoscope. The, uh, the endoscope was the vehicle of it. That leads, uh, the F, that leads and brings the FDA to the, to the announcement that we should move to, um, um, uh, to, a, to a better um, developing of the endoscope, making reprocessing of endoscope on endoscopes easier, more effective, or even unnecessary, meaning bringing us to single-use endoscopes. And you know that uh, there are single-use endoscopes onto the market now, doing bronchoscopy, doing ERCP now. So um, we have an ongoing discussions about that. Um, is near, near zero not enough? Do we really proclaim a zero, no uh, zero tolerance study? Then single use becomes mandatory, meaning just alone for the US, around 400,000 disposable duodenoscopes, besides of 17 million gastrocoloscopes. So that will really generate a great waste. Is it really justified to get rid of this cross-contamination problem. Nice study here from the US uh, about ecology of um, endoscopy uh, and the ecological impact of endoscopes, purely endoscopes, on the environment. Uh, it's a nice study with all 280 procedures of a, in a five-day period, and they generate in total 620 kilograms of waste reprocessing endoscope just by reprocess everything, which is a 2.1 kilogram waste and 
46 liters of volume for each procedure, and 64% of this waste is, was going to a landfill, 28% was biohazardous waste, and only 8% was recycled. And to make it crystal clear for you now, you can fill up 117 soccer fields with a waste of one meter, or in tons, it's equivalent to almost 25,000 passenger cars every year alone in the US. So if you switch over and change to single-use endoscope. So we have to keep that also in mind. What is the pro for the using disposables? This is patient safety? Yeah, because we have no cross-contamination and we have no more cleaning. And nowadays we have the discussions about CO2 footprint of reusable and single-use. And meaning reusable means how many procedures can I do, all of those reprocessing things, maintenance, repairs, everything. Because each cleaning process requires um, liters of water, um, chemicals, um, the time, the human resources, everything. So disposable, if disposable is allowed in the future to be fully recyclable, probably that's even more um, and better in uh, looking and focusing on CO2. So we have both of these two different approaches, the ecological and the economic viewpoint, single-use versus reusable. On the left-hand side, you see the waste when you reprocess one endoscope. Probably it's even better, like on the right-hand side, to have a single-use endoscope you put into the trash after one procedure. So we grew up with, uh, okay, endoscope is very valuable tool, and, uh, you're not able, we have to handle it very, very carefully. So this disposable thing is a little bit against our gut feeling, but we don't know. And there were really nice studies now compare the CO2 footprint, reusable versus single use endoscope. And they put into this analysis and this method all of the things, the manufacturing of both devices, uh, the usage of action, reprocessing, repair, repairs, replacement and disposal. To, uh, to sum that up, the overall environmental impact and footprint of single use, meaning 2,000 times used and uh, reprocessed versus reusable, is comparable. When you put into that analysis everything, production, waste, and everything. That's for us for, um, um, for ureteroscopes, and we also have that for bronchoscopes. It's quite comparable. So you have to keep in mind concerning and focusing only on CO2 footprint and waste, that's comparable. So let me summarize. Green hospital, green health uh, status quo. Uh, sustainability in the healthcare system, and especially in private practice hospitals, is one of the key challenging questions in the next 10, 20 years for us. Not for us, but for our children and grandchildren. And we have to keep in mind that the hospitals have the largest environmental impact than any other areas um, in our healthcare system. And please keep in mind, the main problem, the major problem is the overuse, um, the high number of wasteful procedures, which will not have only environmental, but also have financial and health-relevant uh, influences. So, I have told it and talked to you about to use the choose wisely strategy, meaning do fewer procedures and treatment. This will have the biggest impact on CO2 footprint and emissions and makes uh, it even more important than having it more greener. So the two main goals and my two main take-home messages, working smarter, not harder. And we have to increase our ability of recycling of our resources. That's one of the major goals. So the principles of sustainable, not endoscopy, but also hospital, it's not only laudable, it is mandatory in the future, not for us, but for all of our people worldwide and our the next generation. Thank you so much.